Hey, hey, what's up, gardening friends? Jeff here. How's everybody doing? I hope you're doing well. I'm great. I'm <laughs> fighting with the sun to film this video for like, I don't know, two weeks, trying to find the right time of day where the light's right. And it just, it's not gonna be there. So just gonna have to make it work. Heliconias. If you watch my channel, you probably know these are by far, I think, my favorite tropical plant. Been that way since I was a little kid. I stumbled upon a Heliconia hirsuta at a local nursery when I was like, I don't know, 12 or 14 years old, and uh, ever since have just been in love with these plants. So let's talk about them. Heliconias, a broad family of plants. There are lots and lots and lots of, I wanna say over 200 different types of Heliconias. I'm just gonna be going over like basic Heliconia info in this video because otherwise I could go on about these plants for easily an hour and I don't think that that's necessary. Lots of different forms, lots of different types. To keep it basic I'll say that there's the torch type flowers which come up as you see right here they're more of an upright flower and then there's the pendulous type which come down and hang and that's very 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 basic. And for essence or the bract on this plant really is nice shiny waxy they come in all different colors and shapes sizes. The actual flowers themselves are tucked away very very far in there and they're very small. And what you're seeing in here all these little dots those are the seeds. They're largely grown for their flowers which all of mine are going out of flower right now so they don't look Perfect, but I think they're still quite beautiful. The Sideracorum types, which are just the parrot speak heliconias, are the most common. They're what we see, at least here in the US, more often than any of the others because they multiply very, very, very rapidly and they flower freely. And that's not going to be the case for all Sideracorums, but the Andromedas, the Lady Di, the Chacaniana, all of those look fairly similar. This one right here is an Andromeda, an old Andromeda that's getting ready to die off when it wants to drop those seeds. Then over here I have some that are more of like a Chacaniana Andromeda hybrid. So you can see here this that modified leaf. That's what a bract is. It's just a modified leaf and this one still didn't fully differentiate so it has an actual leaf on the end of it. Which is something that can also be seen when looking at this one right here that's just in bud and just getting ready to open. Very pretty flowers. And up here I have some of those Chacanianas which are just more of an orange flower. When it comes to just the color on those Chacos, they're not my favorite. However, they do seem to grow the fastest and flower the most out of the other Sitter Corms that I'm growing right now. Outdoors, they're simple, easy to grow. They spread like wildfire and the pollinators absolutely love them. They add just a striking pop of color wherever you put them. Well, at least while they're in flower, they add a striking pop of color. And then all of my hirsutas are going out of flower right now. But here's an example of the growth on them. So you can see these have more of a reed light growth where the those leaves come up alternating along the stem and then they put their flowers up a little bit higher than the Sideracorums do. Also, I hear mixed pronunciation, Sideracorum, Sideracorum, doesn't matter to me. You know what we're talking about here. Here's a smaller flower for the Heliconia hirsuta. And this one is the variety Costa Flores. The regular Heliconia hirsuta, that's not the Costa Flores, they do tend to have more bracts and go up higher. The same thing with the Peru, but this is what I got in flower right now to show you. Very pretty, and this one is actually my favorite for overwintering indoors. And then there are also the Latispathas, which have a really beautiful elongated bract on them. Latispathas are commonly hybridized with some of the other Heliconias. They're great plants. The only thing I will say about them is that sometimes, this is where you need to go and do your research on which ones you want to get, sometimes they'll hold their flowers. Those bracts will be down inside the foliage and yet you don't even really get to see them. That's common with, a fair amount of heliconias out there, like the dwarf Jamaican. They're cool, they're really little, but you don't really see the flowers unless you go in and prune the foliage out from around them. Hey, even if you have to search for them, they're still beautiful, it's worth it. You can see why they're called the false bird of paradise, right? They look like a bird of paradise. They flower much more prolifically though. You know, hop over here into the shade and bounce back over to the patio here in a minute. Let's talk about actually, like, how do we grow these things? Heliconias being such a big group of plants, Take the care with a grain of salt. It's important to actually research what variety you have. Some will grow at higher altitudes where it's gonna be more cool up in like the rain clouds and some will be at lower elevations. The main thing that they all have in common though is that these plants do not like to dry out, at least not for very long. That being said, they also prefer things more on the humid side which can make them tricky for growing indoors. So they're a moisture loving plant that prefers things more on the humid side. And they also, in general, not all of them, but most of them prefer things 
fairly warm and are not going to be very tolerant of cooler temperatures. And by cooler temperatures, I mean below like 55 degrees Fahrenheit. It doesn't mean that temperatures below 55 are going to kill these plants. Frost will kill almost all of them. There are some varieties that are more cold hardy than others, but if we're just talking about the Citrocorums here and the Hirsutas, the more common ones, they prefer to not go through frost. They're not going to look good afterwards. They may rebound from the ground, but it's a setback. With the majority of Heliconias, you'll see their best growth over 75 degrees, really more into the 80 degree Fahrenheit range. As I mentioned, they like it warm. That growth is going to slow when the nighttime temperatures start to fall below 70, and it's going to like basically completely pause once things are below 55 to 50. With my Heliconias, I will leave them out when the nighttime temperatures are dipping into the 40s, but that's only if I know that the temperature is about to warm right back up and it's gonna to get toasty again. So we've had a few nights in the 40s here in St. Louis over the last few days, but it's like 76 right now, and I think the high today is 82. It's supposed to stay that way for a few more days. The ground is still nice and warm. The sun's really strong, and all my plants are just, they're surrounded by pavement, which does help push that heat back out at nighttime when the cooler temperatures are out. You may have noticed I focused a little bit more here on temperature and water before I even jumped into talking about light, and that's because light varies across the board with these plants. Some are going to want high intense full sun from sunrise to sunset, especially the further north you go. The further you get away from the equator and the less intense the sun is and the more light they're going to need. I have always found the best growth with my Andromedas, Chacanianas, all the ones that I mentioned before, when they get a really good amount of morning sun, say like four to five hours, and then shade in the afternoon. Yes, you have to do your research to know what type of light your Heliconias are going to want that you're growing. But like I said, for me, I like them to get a really good amount of morning sun and then some protection in the afternoon when the sun is really intense. And again, you have to remember my plants are surrounded by piping hot pavement. So that is a contributing factor there is to why I like for them to have some reprieve from the afternoon heat or the afternoon light, which can go in and scorch the ones that I grow. If they're getting too much light, the foliage will start to curl. And actually these down here are curled, so you can see what I'm talking about. They'll fold up to protect themselves from the sun when it's too intense, and then eventually you'll see photo oxidation on them if that can't be corrected. You'll know that that's the reason their leaves are folding up if when the light moves off of them, they go ahead and fold back out. That means they were just trying to protect themselves. They will also curl these leaves up when they're thirsty. I have it sitting in a bucket right now. We had a bunch of rains, so there's some nice rainwater in there for it to drink up. It's one that needs to be repotted, so it's becoming very hard to keep it hydrated, and hence the cupped up leaves there. It's just telling me that it's thirsty. No surprise, these are very, very, very thirsty plants. Heliconias are also heavy feeders. The uh, main nutrients that they usually have issues with are nitrogen, because they're very hungry plants, and magnesium. Those are usually what you'll find that needs to be corrected for with them. Easy to do, you can use an all-purpose fertilizer. I've actually found that amending the soil really does seem to work the best for keeping the foliage nice and green. It's really common when you're growing these in pots to have some foliage. Like you can see there's some striping on here. So it's not one solid deep green color. That's not unusual and it's never been a problem for me as long as I've made sure to stay on top of getting some compost and some things amended into the surface of the soil probably every couple of months. I've used all kinds of fertilizers with them from all-purpose liquid fertilizers to fertilizers that are made specifically for bananas and hibiscus and run the whole gamut. I haven't really noticed one to like actually make them just excel more than another but I have noticed that when doing the amendments and using things like sea kelp and alfalfa meal and there's a whole bunch of different things you can use that those seem to be the most effective if you're really trying to get them to just grow out of control, which isn't hard to do. Heliconias, especially if you live some place, zones, I'd say zones 10 and further south or just warmer, these will fill in an area very, very, very quickly, which is another reason I kind of like them for pots. I mean, where I live, they're not going to fill in and take over any spots, but if you live someplace in the south where you could grow these as a perennial, but you don't want to because of that invas invasive nature, I would say, a pot, you can use a pot, works fine. These are rhizomatic plants. They're super easy to divide when they fill out their pot too much. You can just pull them on out, cut it into half or cut it into quarters and then repot them. And they will stall for a few weeks normally, but with some water and some love, they'll start to take off again. As far as pests are concerned, I haven't noticed these to be prone to anything unusual. If it's too dry, then spider mites absolutely love them, but these plants love humidity, so spider mites shouldn't be a problem if they're getting proper humidity. I have found mealybugs on mine before, but not 
like an unusual amount just because I have some mealybugs in my yard, so I just go through and pick them off. But it's not like they seem to be drawn to these more than other plants, at least not in my experience. Okay, so there's the rundown on just very basic, general, Heliconia info. What about growing them indoors? That's where things get tricky. Heliconias are not a plant that I would consider to be an easy house plant because of everything I mentioned before with the care. They like things warm, they like things humid. Indoors, that's harder to achieve, especially if you're going to provide proper airflow. Because with heat and humidity indoors where there's low airflow, that's when you start to encounter issues with pests and rot. And these will be susceptible to rot especially if they're in a pot. I should have probably mentioned that before. As long as you live someplace really, really warm, then you can almost grow these marginally, like just pot them up in like mud. I wouldn't recommend doing that. But I see people in Thailand do that where they're just basically in topsoil that's drenched with water at all times. And one of the places I order my heliconias from, they are usually shipped up in mud. And I have to get them out of that mud because that will not work for my growing conditions. It might be okay while they're outside and things are nice and hot, but once I take them inside and it's only, you know, 70 something degrees, they're just going to rot. So that doesn't work. So if you're like me and your heliconias have to have a winter vacation in the house and they summer outdoors, it is important to find a balance between a moisture retentive potting soil that's very rich in organics, but that soil still needs to drain well enough that they aren't going to rot. Another reason these are difficult to keep indoors. I've tried growing these lots of different ways indoors and then had successes and then repeated those successes and it hasn't always been successful. If you can't repeat your method, then it's not always something to suggest to people, right? So I'll just go through some of the various things that I've done with them. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And I'm going to attribute a lot of that to the temperatures within my grow space. Rhizomatic plants that have a dormant period, much easier to keep inside. Well, not even keep inside, to just let them rest during the wintertime. Heliconias are a true, true tropical. They don't really have a dormant period. You can get them into a slowed growth phase, which I mean, you could kind of consider dormancy, but it's not really, it's more just the plant hanging on by a thread for several months until you can take it outside and get at those nicer conditions to start taking off again. So there are basically two different ways that I've experimented with and had successes both ways with how to overwinter these indoors. The first way is to put them in my grow space, which is my garage where it's heated, there's humidifiers. It's warm and wet in there. That has worked well as long as I place them very close to the grow lights because indoor lighting, not the same as outdoor lighting. I'm not using super high par grow lights. So they're probably uh, a foot and a half below the grow lights. They get about 12 to 13 hours of light a day under those grow lights. And I'll let them dry about 50 to 75% of the way as long as the humidity is above 70%. The humidity has been below that. I know this seems complicated, but I told y'all these aren't really the easiest plants to keep inside. Some of them are easier than ours. We'll talk about that later. The other way that I've also had success with keeping these indoors was to keep them more on the cool side and to let them almost dry completely in between waterings, still getting lots and lots of light, but it's cooler. So they aren't being told to grow, 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 grow so they don't necessarily need the water. Now, when I did that, they did basically spend the entire winter with their leaves curled and cupped because they were thirsty. But when I would go ahead and start watering them the way I normally would if it were warm, then they started to get a little bit stinky and I had to treat them for root rot. So that's when I went ahead and just said, okay, fine, we're just gonna keep things cool and dry this year and we just keep our fingers crossed and it worked out well. Actually, I think that those heliconias overwintered the best out of any I had ever overwintered. And by cool, I mean uh, around 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere in there. Okay, now for people who aren't using their garage as a grow space and it's not as easy to control the temperatures, let's think south facing window, right? Keep it a couple feet away from the window because it's gonna be really cold and drafty there. But as long as they're getting direct light for, I would say, a minimum of four to six hours a day, that's probably going to be enough. And then I would water them when they're roughly 50% dry or even better. Instead of me guessing when you should water them, pay attention to your plant. Look at how long it takes for them to curl those leaves up. When the leaves start to curl, that means it's time to water. Observe those patterns and just get to know the plant and see when you actually need to water it. Keeping up that humidity, that's going to be more difficult. Maybe you live someplace where you have humid winters and that'll be easier. The winter air here is pretty dry. Humidity is typically like 
40 to 50% somewhere in there, sometimes even more dry. So they don't really appreciate. So that's why I don't really bother with these in my house and I put them in my grow space where I can control all of those things. But there are ways around that, right? Grouping your plants together, having a nice, nice mixture of all your plants that can help keep the humidity up around them. I wouldn't bother with misting because that only helps while the water is actually on the leaves of the plants. And sometimes depending on your tap water can leave spots on the foliage and sometimes can lead to some other problems. Some plants it's okay with these. I just, I don't know. I don't think it's a great idea. Misting plants to keep humidity up is a very temporary fix to dry air. Like I said, it's only effective while the water is on the plant and evaporating off the plant. But humidifiers, you can put a humidifier near the plant. If you're that dedicated to keeping them clean and changing out the water, then go for it. I'm sure the plant would love that. Uh, pebble trays are good. But with taller plants like these, I mean, there are some heliconias that don't get very big. These, you know, expect three to four feet of foliage when they're super mature, but generally they start flowering when they have about 18 to 24 inches of leaves on them. Oops, gotta get back into the shade there with that shot, sorry. And if your plant's really high up from the pebble tray, if you have a little tray underneath there with some pebbles in it and keep water in there, that evaporation, I don't know how helpful that actually is to the foliage. I don't know, this is Sunscorch. So if you want to know what that looks like, that's what that is. I would have to say the key to these plants is going to be the same as with a lot of the other true tropical heat loving plants. You just have to remember that the more light and the more heat the plant gets, the more water it's going to need, and the lesser it gets of those things and the less water it's going to need. Really in wintertime, it's not as much to me about keeping the plant growing and flowering. It's about keeping it alive and avoiding root rot. All right, so that's what I do with my Sideracorums and the Latispathas and some others. But for the Hirsutas, I've grown them everywhere I just mentioned before, and I have even just cut them back completely and made sure they stayed warm and splashed the pot with some water, I'd say every few weeks, and then just moved them back out into the sun and the heat in the springtime, gave them water and they would just shoot right back out of the pot. That's why I really like the hirsutas because their vigor is extreme. Most of the heliconias are pretty vigorous, but those hirsutas, any plant where you can just cut the top off of it and keep those rhizomes alive during the winter time, move them outside and they take off and we'll fill out that pot again within a matter of weeks and start flowering within a matter of months. Those are my kinds of plants. I like that. I realized that it, I made it just sound like that was a lot. It really isn't. And I also have heliconias like the Rostrata, which is very blended in with the others here, but there's one back here. It doesn't have flowers on it. It's a pendulous type of heliconias like the Rostrata that have that long dangly flower bract on it. Those typically only bloom on mature old growth. So the Rostrata, if you want to get one that's going to flower, you either need to get it when it's a nice big size, I would say a minimum of four to five feet, then maybe you'll get flowers from it that year. Otherwise, most people like myself, you'll get them when they're smaller, say anywhere from 18 to 24 inches, somewhere in there, or maybe you just bought a rhizome. And you got to keep that alive during the winter time. So you start it during the summer, keep it alive all winter, and then hopefully the next year you'll get flowers on them. Because again, it needs to be that second year growth that you'll get the flowers on. And some heliconas, it'll even take longer than that to get the flowers on them. The Rostrata is one of the more popular ones for growing indoors because it does tend to be just a smidge bit more tolerant of indoor conditions than are a lot of the Sideracorum types. So if you want one of the pendulous types, I would recommend a Rostrata because they're just slightly, just a smidge bit more okay with the normal indoor temperatures and lower humidity, but they're still very prone to rot. And uh, they're one of those plants where you'll take them in, they'll look fine for a few months. And then when it, you're getting a month or so out from spring, they start to kind of like, uh, and that's when you start to panic. You're like, okay, we need that heat to get here. Need to get the plant outside and thriving again. And I'm just going to mention this cause I know I'll get asked about it. I said that these plants don't really have a dormancy, which also tells us that no, you really, these aren't great plants to just dig the rhizomes up and store them during the winter time. They tend to not do well with that. The rhizomes typically I found about a month is about as long as they'll store, at least the types that I've grown. Usually you want to get them planted as soon as you receive those in the mail, which tells us that during the winter time, they're probably not going to do great just hanging out in a box with some peat moss in a closet somewhere, right? Wouldn't that be fantastic though, if we could just treat these like a can of lily? where you plant it in the ground, let it do its thing all year, and then lift those rhizomes up, clean them off and store them for the winter. 
You don't have to worry about them again until spring. That would be fantastic. There might be some varieties, types of heliconias where that's possible. Unfortunately, there is not a ton of information out there about how to grow these indoors. There's very basic information that just says, hey, heliconias like light, don't let them dry out, and like basic houseplant stuff. Information that I haven't personally found to be very useful because it's just taking their likes for outdoors and applying it to inside, which isn't useful for a plant that likes things hot and humid and moist. Indoors isn't hot and humid and moist, so it doesn't seem safe to me to break down the care info to give them a lot of light and a lot of moisture indoors because the conditions are different. You don't have the airflow and you don't have the heat. Tons of moisture indoors. That's when you start to have issues with rot. But if you have a very warm home, some people do keep their homes like over 75 degrees. If you're one of those people, I'd give it a shot. Maybe this will make a fantastic houseplant for you. Gardening's becoming more popular. Heliconias are where I live, largely grown as an annual. You can get them relatively cheap if you can find them. That's the thing, you can't usually find them. But on the rare occasion that this far north, which I'm not that far north, but you know what I mean. When I can find them, they're like 10 bucks a pop. A lot of people just throw them in mixed containers and then toss them at the end of the year. I love them too much to do that. Now I can't take all of them in because I, I planted a lot of heliconias this year, but it's always possible to take little clumps from the different sections, pot them up, take them inside and do what you gotta do to keep them alive. It's one of those things where it's trial and error. And as I was getting to over time, the more people are doing it, then the more feedback everybody can provide to talk about what really is actually working if you want to grow these as a houseplant, especially if you want to grow them as a houseplant all year round. That's where the comment section comes in handy. Comment down below, tips, tricks, suggestions, very valuable. Anytime you watch a care video, check out the comments and see what people have to add to the conversation. It's impossible to remember everything for one video and uh, everybody's climates are going to be different. And you know, in my situation, a lot of people aren't filling their garage with plants and setting up a big pond and humidifiers and all these things to give them the proper conditions. So my conditions aren't necessarily the most relatable, but I have grown them in my home, like I mentioned with the hirsuta, where I would just cut it back and just basically let it chill most of the winter time. Just make sure that that soil gets a light watering, not a total flush through. I should have said that. If the objective is just to keep those rhizomes alive and you're not worried about the foliar growth on the plant, then it's a good idea to not give them such a heavy watering that you're looking for a total flush throughout the bottom of the pot. Just a drink of water on top to help keep the soil moist around those rhizomes. And that should be good. If they have green growth on them, that's different. And like I said, you just have to Pay attention to the plant and see when it wants the water. So that was a long discussion, hopefully helpful. My goal here was to give the broad look at what they prefer and the things that they like in order to grow. And then at people, you just kind of have to decipher and go through the process of eliminations of what's working and what isn't to help keep them alive during the winter time. So a little bit of how to grow heliconias indoors and a little bit of we need to get together and discuss this. Get some input from everybody else so we can get some better ideas, right? All right, hope everybody's doing well, having a great day and a great life and everything's going just beautifully for you. And as I mentioned, comment down below. Feedback is always necessary. It's how we all learn and grow together. Another thing I should have mentioned, yes, once these seeds start to dry out, you can take those and plant those. Put them in a nice, well-drained soil, keep them moist, lots of warmth and light. I generally only bury them like a quarter of an inch, if even, and they'll take off. All right, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye.